Well, a number of you had some questions about the traditional square of opposition, so I thought I would do this little film just to talk about it. And let me tell you why we do this. Um, interestingly enough, we're learning logic backwards, that at least historically backwards, because Aristotelian logic was the more um, standard form of logic, and then Boole came along. Now, the reason Boole came along and did his system of logic is because Aristotelians were proving the existence of things based on logical propositions and uh, basically they were using universals to prove the existence of things which Boole saw as being a fallacy. As a matter of fact we call that the existential fallacy. And so Boolean logic is more true to the meanings of the statements that we're using. But if we know that what we're talking about exists Aristotelian logic can do a lot more. So Boolean logic is simpler because we're really only dealing with the um, diagonals, right, the uh, contradictories. But with Aristotelian logic, we can say more about the relationships between the categorical statements. And that's why we have the traditional square of opposition. So when can we use Aristotelian logic? Really, um, we can use Aristotelian logic when the things that we're talking about are known to exist. All right, when the things that we're talking about are known to exist. So, if we're talking about, um, you know, dogs, cats, flowers, trees, things like that, we can use Aristotelian. If we're talking about um, fairies and leprechauns and things like that, we're going to use the Boolean standpoint. Now, even when we're talking about things whose existence is controversial, UFOs, Bigfoot, things like that, we're still going to use the Boolean because it would be begging the question then to assume that they exist as part of the argument. But using the traditional or Aristotelian standpoint, we can actually make more inferences about the relationships between these statements. And let me show you. So we have the modern square of opposition, right? And all the modern square does is it says, you know, if A is true, O has to be false. Uh, similarly, if O is true, A is false, and E and I have that same relationship, right? The corners have opposite truth values. The contradictories are still going to hold for the Aristotelian perspective. But we're going to add some relationships as well, all right? And I'll discuss each of these relationships separately. On top, between the A and the E, we have the contrary. The contrary relation says that at least one of those has to be false. Both cannot be true. So if A is true, E has to be false. If E is true, A has to be false. However, um, if A is false, E could be true or false. All right? It's equally false that all dogs are poodles and no dogs are poodles. So one of them does not have to be true, but they cannot both be true. You can't say all dogs are poodles um, and no dogs are poodles. That wouldn't make any sense if there were dogs. All right. The next is the subcontrary. Now the subcontrary is similar to the contrary but works differently. With the contrary, both of them cannot be true. With the subcontrary, both cannot be false. All right? So the subcontrary, if I is true, actually, I and O can both be true. Let me try that again. If I is false, O has to be true. If O is false, I has to be true. All right? So they can both be true, but they cannot both be false. All right, so again, if I is true, O can be either true or false. We just don't know. Now, subalternations, I know a lot of you have questions about that because subalternations work different in different directions. Basically, with subalternations, if the top is true, the bottom is true, okay? If it's true that all dogs are mammals, then it's got to be true that some dogs are mammals. If it's true that no dogs are cats, it's also got to be true that some dogs are not cats. 
all right? Now, it doesn't follow the other way around, because if it's true that some dogs are poodles, it doesn't mean all dogs are poodles, all right? If it's true that some cats are not Siamese cats, it doesn't mean no cats are Siamese cats. I apologize, I'm trying to be fair to both species. Now, um, on the other hand, if I is false, A is going to be false. If O is false, E is going to be false. So if we have a false I statement, then A is automatically false. Okay? If it's false that some dogs are cats, then it's going to be false that all dogs are cats. If it's false that some cats are not house pets, it's also going to be false that no cats are our house pets. All right. Now, how do we remember all this stuff? It's actually very simple. Think about this. Where does truth come from? Truth comes from above, right? It comes from heaven. We know that. That's the place where logic lives, despite the assumptions that some of you might make about uh, the seventh circle of hell. Um, on the other hand, where does falsehood come from? Falsehood comes from the devil. Okay, so falsehood goes up, truth comes down. All right, that's an easy way to remember this. So let's look at an example. We have a false I statement, right? We're just given that. What do we know? Well, using the contradictory, E has to be true. All right, subalternation, false goes up, which makes A false. Or, again, knowing that E is true, using the contrary, A has to be false. All right? And what's that going to tell us about O? I'm going to give you a little time to think. I put music in the background, but there are um, issues of um, copyright. And if I sang, there would be issues of torturing students, which I don't want to be accused of. Okay, you ready? Do you know what O is? This should be fairly easy. The easy way is to use the contradictory here. But again, we also know that truth fault goes down and that both of these cannot be false using the subcontrary. And so O is, are you ready? True. All right? So hopefully this makes sense. Now, in this particular case, knowing the truth value of 1 gave us the truth value of all of them. But let's look at another one. OK? If we know that E is false, right, we can use the contradictory to make I true. All right, but truth doesn't go upward. And if E is false, A could still be false. And if I is true, O could still be true, right? Both of them can't be false, but both of them could be true. So O and A, in this particular case, have undetermined truth values. Now, if we were doing a syllogism, what we would do, not even, sorry, it wouldn't be a syllogism. It would be one premise and one conclusion. Syllogisms have two premises and one conclusion. We would have, say, the premise uh, E is false. Therefore, A is whatever. Since we can't draw any conclusion about A, it would be invalid to draw any kind of conclusion about A based on E being false. Similarly, with I being true, to draw any kind of conclusion about A or O would also be invalid. Okay? But if the premise is a true I statement and the conclusion is a false E statement, then it's right, valid. Good. Okay, and that's it. I hope this helped explain the traditional square of opposition. And uh, if you have any more requests, I'll be glad to uh, post more videos. Until later, bye.